Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. I am very happy to be with you for the next 60 or so minutes, and I am very excited to introduce our esteemed guests. Before we do, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, I want to welcome you from wherever you may be uh, tuning in from today. I know I can see from the chat uh, all over. Uh, we've got Facebook. We're uh, live on Instagram Live on Periscope, on, gosh, I think one or two others at least, and of course, at creativelive.com slash TV. And I also want you to know, along with the, in this sort of housekeeping segment here, that I do see all of your comments from whatever platform you're on. Uh, and yet the best experience, what I see the first, uh, the comments that come onto my screen first are at creativelive.com slash TV. If you click join chat up there, um, that will be the way to get those questions um, percolated up uh, the fastest, and it's my goal to usher some of those questions to our guest today. Uh, of course, I'll be I'll be trying to see the question volume and um, curate those questions in a manner that's going with the flow of the show. But please feel free to ask them. That is one of the ways that you can impact and control the show, help uh, contribute to. Um, to the broadcast today. Um, I do want to say thank you for everyone tuning in from all over the world. And I see we've got folks joining from uh, Brazil. I don't even know what time it is in Brazil right now, but we've got Brazil, New York, fellow Seattleites. Nice to see you in the house. New York, London, Esparreto, California from Lynn Faustine. Thank you, Lynn. In short, we've got a worldwide global audience and that is a good cue for me to get into the introduction of our guest. Again, um, I'm. this has been a long time coming. I've been working on this uh, guest for probably six to 12 months. Um, Ijoma Iluo is a Seattle-based writer, speaker, and I love this, an internet yeller. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, So You Want to Talk About Race, which was published in January uh, a year ago by Seal Press, named one of the Roots 100 Most Influential African Americans in 2017, one of the most influential people in Seattle by Seattle Magazine, one of the 50 most influential women in Seattle by Seattle Met, and winner of the 2018 Feminist Humanist Award by the American Humanist Society. Our guest's work focuses primarily on issues of race and identity, feminism, social and mental health, social justice, the arts, and personal essay. She's been featured in the Washington Post, NBC News, Elle Magazine, Time, The Stranger, The Guardian, and others. Uh, I am. It brings me great pleasure, and please, wherever you are in the world, tap on your desk, tap on some keys, raise your hands. Um, welcome Ijoma Iluo to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. And fellow Seattleite, we are yeah. we are using the internet, but we are probably um, I don't know, like two miles apart as the crow flies. Yeah, I mean we've we have driven away. We took a little socially distanced vacation down the Oregon coast right now, so um, I am I am the furthest away from you I've been in in four months. <laughs> well, I hope it's I hope it's pleasant, not because it's further away from me, but. Uh, <laughs> some much deserved uh, time. I know it's so hard to get space when you lived in the space for the last however many months. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. And we were uh, making some small talk as in the five minutes before we go live when we were checking connections and whatnot. And we recapped something. Uh, I was asking you if there's some things we want to talk about. And one of the items that was on my, I got a half a dozen here that I want to talk about. Um, one of them is the fact that the book is really three years old or three years old since you wrote it, two years out in the market. And, um, I, I, a lot of people are asking you, it's like you're, you're on book tour and you already did that. And so I thought an interesting place to start our conversation is around what context, how context matters so much and yet not really relative to the work that you're doing. It's everything and nothing simultaneously. And now here we are um, at uh, a very impactful moment in time. And yet the book that you wrote, that you wrote uh, two, two and three years ago um, is atop the New York Times bestselling book list here. So 
what has changed for you and how has the conversation changed since your book has has come out now that we're multi year years into the book's life? Oh yeah. So you know, I would say I started writing this book probably 2016. It came out January 2018. Um, and what, you know, where I am as a, as a person is, you know, huge. I mean, that was my first book and I definitely thought the book had, you know, reached the peak of what it was going to reach in the few months after it came out. Um, and then to see it selling now more than it ever had sold before is, is very strange. And I would say that, you know, it's interesting because when I wrote the book, I wrote the book really talking about the day-to-day -day discussions around race, right? How to talk about race with your coworkers, your family, like how to deal with these day-to-day -day issues, how to look at these day-to-day -day issues. And so it was weird for me to see this book being used at a time when we're talking, you know, where we're collectively outraged and grieving and talking about, you know, these huge structures of police brutality, um, for people to be like, wait a minute, what's this problem? What's going on? Let me start and see, see this issue. Because that's not at all how I had envisioned the book being used. I really had envisioned, I even remember writing, you know, in the, in the beginning chapters of the book, talking about people who are just now coming to realize this was an issue. Um, and so then, you know, to realize, oh, wait, this many people are, there were this many more people that were just now waiting now years later. Um, but it's also interesting to see because I think that there's some parts of the book where I feel like the conversation has moved far beyond what I was talking about, especially looking at the chapter on police brutality mm -hmm. um, and, and seeing the conversation move and wishing you could have kind of a real time update of work as it goes. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad the conversation has moved past. Is there a problem? Is police brutality real? Um, you know, there are some people who hang on to that, but I think the conversation we're having right now is, you know, how do we dismantle this system? Do we defund the police? Um, and that's progress. It's not as fast as I think any of us would have wanted it to be. It's certainly not as fast as activists, you know, even 50 years ago talking about, you know, police violence would have wanted it to be, but it is definitely progress. Well, uh, I just bought, I have the original version and I've got the Kindle version, which has an updated preface that I found really interesting and uh, it, it in some ways references the conversation that you and I are having right now. Um, and the discussion guide, you know, it points to the discussion guide at the end, which was incredibly helpful for me. Um, and asking people who are prepared to read the book, maybe in a book club setting, you know, what did you hope to get out of the book? And that makes me want to ask you now, three years on, has the book done for you what you hoped it would? And is the, are we just getting started or has it, ha, you know, where are we in the journey of um, your writings? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely say the book itself was a primer, right? So I wasn't looking at it and saying, oh, I'm going to change the world with this book. I was thinking, well, hopefully we can get past step A, you know, if, if people read and engage with the book. And I do think that for a lot of people, it's done that. And that's been wonderful to hear. Like I hear from people, people email me, they message me all of the time saying, you know, I brought this into a, this book into a meeting because as a black person in this office, I couldn't stand being talked over anymore. And I was able to use the discussions in here. I was able to talk about these points. I've heard from, you know, couples who are saying, I never understood my partner's lived experience, but now I'm realizing that maybe I've been harmful in the way I've been acting like this isn't happening. Um, you know, it's been interesting to see orgs use it. It's even been interesting to see people not use it. Someone emailed me and it was uh, really interesting. It messaged me saying she had been hired from a place where they literally had brought my book out during the interview and she was being hired for an equity position. And this white woman was using the book like to kind of guide <laughs> her questions. And she was like, oh, okay. And so she had first reached out to me to tell me about this. And I just thought that was kind of hilarious um, and had like the phonetic spelling of my name on the book, which was really cute. But then, you know, one thing that she said that was interesting was what she noticed was my book was everywhere. And my book was really clear and it was very clear that people weren't actually using the book. Like there was this piece of material, this reminder everywhere that was of how to have productive conversations, you know, how to not get caught up in your own fragilities. 
and people weren't doing it. And it was like, she was like, it was really actually helpful to say, this was right here. You've been quoting this and you're not doing any of this. You're actually not committed to this work. Um, so even, even when it's not being done, I've found in some places that's useful, but people actually have to read the book. That was one of the shocking things was to realize that, you know, this book has been out as long as it has, and it takes something this drastic for people to be like, let me find that 101 guide. Um, in numbers, you know, I would say I've sold more copies of this book in the last month than I have sold in the last two and a half years. Wow. Um, and that's great and horrifying at the same time to realize, oh, oh, okay, this is what it takes to be in the beginning stages. Because I think many of us who do this work would have hoped that by this stage, people would have been like, um, where do I talk methodology? How do I, how do I actually burn this down? Like, how do I, what do I rebuild, you know, um, and moved on to far more radical works, um, far more strategic works. Um, but it's better than never, you know, yeah. which is a really sad thing to say. <laughs> I'm so yeah. tired of saying it's better than never, <laughs> um, but you know, um, but it is. And for anyone who, who has an e for any BIPOC people who's, who has an easier path, maybe because, someone who has influence in their life is starting this path, you know, I'm yeah. grateful for it. Yeah. I, I remember somewhere, uh, either, I don't remember if it was in the discussion guide or in the, um, somewhere in the book, you talked about it, unsexy fundamentals as in not like flashy, I don't know, what was the, uh, quick takes or something. Mm -hmm. it, it was, it's not those things. It's these unsexy fundamentals. And yet is it, is it this, it's this fundamentals that we need as a culture? And if fundamentals is something that, um, the way I think about fundamentals is, is it's the base of the pyramid. It's where it's all it, it is required because if you, know, you can't have the top of the pyramid without the bottom of the pyramid. And it just strikes me that, that in a way this work will always be relevant. And we want it to not be relevant in the future. This is part of the dichotomy that I'm trying to get through to understand with, for you as a, as the creator of this work. Um, is it both, is it, you know, how does it feel to have something be? Sorry, one second. Sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Malcolm. No, please stop. Go, go away. <laughs> no. Okay. That's fine. The, the ice machine is a bit much. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is quarantine life right now. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm like, I, I need to be quiet. I'm going to do an interview. And then I hear fridge, garbage crumbling. And then I hear the ice machine start. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I just can't. I can't. Oh, it's awesome. It is. You know, we've all had those uh, moments, as you said, in quarantine. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, I'm trying to understand the emotional space that you're holding with respect to have created something that is, as you mentioned, um, you know, unsexy fundamentals. But if we're still relying on the fundamentals, it means, you know, almost reflexive of the conversation you just you just shared with me that we have, you know, we 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 haven't moved forward. How is that? Um, how does that resonate with you? And does it is it frustrating, or do you look at it as required for us to go forward? You know, I think that part of what needs to happen right now, because it is frustrating, and I think that. Like I've been trying to say right now is right now you have to learn and do it at the same time. We can't do this whole um, something horrible's happened, people are dying, let's start a book club, right? It's just not, we can't keep doing this. Um, people, it, people's lives are depending on action, an action. And so what we need to realize, I think right now is, okay, you know what? I've missed something. I am missing out on something, something big. I don't understand. And I need to look to the people who've been fighting this and talking about this and saying something's wrong for a long time. I need to listen to what they say and educate myself at the same time. And I, and you have to run both tracks. Mm -hmm. I do think that the education is important. The fundamentals are important, but we absolutely cannot wait for another whole generation to learn the fundamentals and act. It's, it, we will never catch up. What we need to do is, is to do both at the same time. And I think that oftentimes people hide behind the, let me see how much more information I can gather about this. Let me get a PhD in this before I do anything. Let me have more discussions before I do anything. I can't write anything that hasn't been written before. I can't say anything that hasn't been said before. We are over 400 years into the horrible system of violent white supremacy in this country. And 
it's been said. We're all trying to just find a new way to get people to pay attention, a new angle to try to get people to understand what we've been saying for hundreds of years. So you have to, at some point, trust that the people who are being impacted the most by this system actually have an idea as to what needs to happen or give it a try. Why not? Because what's work right now isn't working, right? Like that's the thing right now is there's, there's so much, um, people are so frozen right now, even in these discussions about should we defund the police? What if it's chaos? I mean, it is chaos. It's already chaos. We have people right now being pepper sprayed in the street. We have people being murdered in the street. We have all these abuses happening. That's and the and chaos we know. Why not, if it can possibly help things, take a leap for the chaos you don't know. Give it a try and learn while you do and read while you do and catch up. But people have to do both right now. People have to start treating this like an emergency. Brilliant. Um, taking a step back from the content for a moment, I'm fascinated by personal journeys and I wanted to explore yours for a moment. Specifically, uh, the audience who's listening is uh, broadly identifies as creators and or entrepreneurs. They are hoping to tap into that thing that they were put on this planet to do. And um, the, the, you know, whatever medium people are pursuing and whatever, you know, content they want to pursue to me is separate from the journey of, of deciding to become or step into the person or the role that you have always wanted to play and either didn't have the awareness or the courage or some other, there's some other thing that was keeping you from the thing. And I was curious if you could walk us through your transformation from, you know, your technology or however you describe your, your earlier work to being a writer, because to see you having put out such a, an amazing body of work. And I understand we'll talk a little bit more in the near future here. You got another book coming out and a movie. Um, but for someone who's, you know, probably 10 years or 10 steps away from their dream right now, could you walk us through your process for moving from not doing the thing that you were put on this planet to do to uh, the role that you're, you're currently playing, which is uh, obviously impacting millions. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I feel very fortunate, honestly, to know, you know, that I'm doing the thing I'm supposed to be doing right now, whether that's my forever thing, I don't know. But I, I know with certainty in a way that I haven't known before, um, that this is what I'm supposed to be doing at this moment. And, you know, it's something that came to me that became, it wasn't even a choice. You know, I started doing this work. I had, I had loved writing as a child, loved writing as a child. Writing was, was my number one thing. And it was definitely, I was that, you know, unicorn kid, right? Partially being like usually the only black kid in every classroom and that nerd that, you know, defied a lot of racist expectations. And people were like, Ooh, let me invest in this child. She loves books, you know? Um, and writing was it. And I had so many teachers tell me, you know, write, you know, write your first book for me, you know, put my name in the acknowledgements. And I had never considered after the age of maybe 10 that I was going to be a writer. Um, and that's simply because I grew up poor and, you know, poor and black. And the thought that I would have something that unsure, and especially when there were so few role models that were being brought to me, you know, in the writing space to show that, you know, a poor black person. And of course they absolutely existed. And I've, you know, I adored, I grew up, you know, adoring, um, my Angelou, adoring Toni Morrison, adoring Lorraine Hansberry, but they were definitely treated like exceptions, you know? And I knew that, you know, for me, it was, are we going to keep the lights on? And we definitely, you know, I mean, we, we'd slept in cars at times as kids and we were not just like, oh, we're a little broke. It was, we didn't have a phone for three years. We would go weeks without electricity. You know, we ate at churches. And so for me, I knew that I was smart. I knew that I was talented. And I, and I knew, I always knew I would be able to translate that. I would find a way to translate that into being able to escape the poverty I had grown up in. And that was my goal. That was my goal as a parent, as a person. And I think that oftentimes 
especially black people in this country are taught, but actually most BIPOC people I know are taught that financial success is its own revolution, right? If you can get to middle class status, if you can pay your bills every month and buy your kids the things that you couldn't have, then you will have accomplished something real and you will have gotten as close to freedom as you can get, you know? And, and we grew up in like that Cosby family age, right? That story. And what I realized as I got older was that was not going to happen, that I was never going to be a whole person anywhere I went. I was never going to not just be the black person in any space, even, even as I succeeded. And the more I succeeded, the more I was going to be tied to being able to take every abuse and, you know, every slight um, the more I was going to lock myself into having to constantly work twice as hard as my white peers. And I was still going to feel unsafe. I was still one traffic stop away from mortal danger. I was still going to worry for my brother, for my sons. Um, and I didn't want to be 60 and still trying to figure out if I had the right to say something. So I started writing just for myself to kind of counter the general gaslighting that happens in Seattle and, and likely other places all around the country. Um, but Seattle is special, you know, in that Seattle really loves to believe that it has it all figured out, that it, it checked the right boxes on its ballots and it recycled enough things and therefore racism isn't a problem in Seattle. And it's easy for Seattle to believe that racism isn't a problem because there's like 15 black people in the whole city. Um, it's a very wealthy city, and those of us who are not wealthy are kind of concentrated in particular areas, hidden away from the vast success and wealth um, that Seattle has. And add on top of that this kind of weird, you know, enforcement of politeness that prevents you from talking about anything real in the city. What I found as I got older is it really felt like I had fallen through this like veil into an alternate reality. You know, I was walking around traumatized and scared and sad and people I had grown up with who said they loved me were just fine, you know, and they would look at me and you know, hmm, that's weird. You know, you're acting like this. Why, why are you doing this? And I needed to know I wasn't alone. And so I just started writing really out of desperation and I'm not even joking when I say like those felt like some of the most desperate years in the years after Trayvon Martin was killed. Um, I was writing just to like be like, okay, this has to be impacting someone as much as it's impacting me. And from there, I started finding other black people in Seattle area, other BIPOC people in Seattle area who connected to my Facebook posts and my blog posts, and, but I had no intention of becoming a writer. And then it started, you know, word nationally, people were picking up on it. And it was strange. Like, you know, I would be at work working in these marketing jobs in this completely white male environments. And I would get like a call from like, you know, um, CNN and they were like, can you talk? And I would have to hide in my car because I knew I couldn't actually talk about these things at work. So I would go sit in my car in the parking lot at work and talk about race in America and then come back into work, you know, take a personal day and fly out and do like an MSNBC thing and, you know, fly back and Whoa. knowing that no one in the office watched MSNBC. So it would be fine. And like, no one would know and not have to have these conversations. And then I just couldn't live like that. I couldn't have this space where I could suddenly talk openly and be heard and appreciated for my truth. And then come to a place for 11 hours a day where I couldn't say anything where I had to act like none of this was impacting me. And and I think this is also where, you know, growing up really poor <laughs> helped in a sense because, you know, my brother is a musician, um, has lived as a musician his entire adult life. But we both have this idea of like, yeah, you know, it will be OK um, if, if I take this leap and it doesn't work out. I know I've been through worse. I've survived worse. And I know I have what it takes. I can hustle if I need to grab three jobs to make things work. And I will. And so one day I just said. I quit and I had, I had no plan. I had no plan. In no way was I, was I writing enough to pay my mortgage. Um, and I had just bought a house, I think six months earlier. <laughs> it was the ridiculous. Uh, but I just knew I couldn't do another day like that. I couldn't have part of me that was full and realized. Um, I couldn't, now that I knew what it was like to be like a whole person, a whole black woman in a space, I couldn't spend most of my time in a space that where I wasn't. 
and so I just quit and hustled and worked my butt off and tried to make as many contacts and totally, you know, like was doing everything. I remember drawing portraits for people to make ends meet, um, you know, just doing any sort of odd jobs out there. When I finally got my, um, when I finally got my book deal and I paid four months of back mortgage <laughs> with my advance. <laughs> and that was basically the whole thing was like, Oh, I didn't lose my house, but I was so close. Um, and it was just the most amazing feeling. I remember being like, okay, I didn't lose my house because I was so afraid that for my kids, you know, that that was going to happen. And from then I just kept building and I've been very fortunate that I've been able to get where I am now. One more, one more layer of detail, if you're willing, is that the space between starting to write as a mechanism for processing and becoming a professional, you know, and, and a book deal like you, you you mentioned that um, you hustled, but this space right there is so, you know, there's so many people listening. Just as a, an example of someone, it's 1.20 in the morning here in Spain. I'm riveted by this conversation. Um, Wisconsin's tuned in. People, I love you so much. I love your book. I'm recommending it to everyone I know. <laughs> and there are also people here who uh, have something to say, and the how is a real block for them especially when they feel underrepresented, especially when they don't feel seen. And your ability to break through, like on a really tactical level, is one thing that I would love for us to come out of this conversation with today. So if, yeah. you're, willing, if you're willing to go one level deeper of what did it look like in that tough space between writing to process pain and hustling, of course, mm -hmm. but and actually getting a book deal. Can you share with us that space? And for mm -hmm. so many, for so many underrepresented um, people, communities, this is such a critical opportunity where there, there is now more than ever an opportunity and give us some steps. Absolutely. You know, I would say one of the ways in which I feel like I was so fortunate is that I was working in marketing when I started writing because what people don't tell you about writing and likely any really creative field where you're trying to make ends meet is how easy, how much it's geared towards privilege and geared towards who, you know, there's so much inside baseball in writing, um, in publishing, in reaching out to editors, in pitching that no one explains to you. And especially if you didn't go, you know, I don't have a degree in journalism. My degree is in political science. Uh, I didn't know. I remember trying to admit to people I didn't know what a pitch was. Like, I could kind of guess. Like, I knew, like, oh, my, I'm throwing something at someone, maybe. <laughs> I know the word. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, I kind of get the motion. Uh, I don't know what it means <laughs> technically how to do this. Um, I didn't know the etiquette of it. And what I had to learn first was that I had to admit those things. Like, I had to just say, I don't know what this means and ask does anyone know? And I, so I started making friends online with people who were in that space and saying, you know, hey, this sounds awkward, but I don't know what it pitches. Can someone tell me? And suddenly I would get these floods of information and people, and I remember even asking editors, like, what's a good pitch to you? And they're like, no one's ever asked me that. Oh my God, what is a good pitch to me? Right. Um, and these are things that like, if you have contacts, you don't have to worry about. Someone says, oh, let me introduce you to someone. Let me get your name in here, you know? And I had, luckily, because I had worked in marketing, I kind of understood a little bit about how to phrase things, how to make things appeal. I learned, you know, I knew automatically to be consistent in my message. So when I started writing, what I remember thinking, as I was starting to make a shift, and at first with, I was writing a lot. And that's what I would say, first and foremost, write a lot and write publicly. I was writing publicly out of necessity because I like have people in mind. Like I need Jeff at the office to understand this and I'm going to put it out here, you know, subtweeting before I was tweeting, but you know, like with a whole essay, right. Of like, Jeff, this is for you. You need to understand <laughs> this. Um, and hoping that, you know, the people that in my life would pick up on this and, and learn. Um, and so I was putting my work out very publicly because I desperately needed it. And what that helped me if you're ever trying to write persuasive essays that made my essays, I think, effective. And when I teach, this is what I teach as well, is I had the audience in my head. 
I had the audience for my piece in my head. It wasn't me. And a lot of times when you're writing, people are like, I'm just going to open up my heart and it's going to be a thing of beauty. And what you're doing is you're actually writing something you've already processed, you've already been through, and you're writing the end of it. You're writing the very flat story. You're not taking anyone on a journey with you because you're not thinking of the person who's going to be reading it. You're thinking, I would like this, you know, and I've seen that. I mean, I could write about a rock collection if I was into rocks and it would be the most boring story ever if I'm writing for myself because I have already fallen in love with rocks and no one who isn't in love with rocks is going to like that. Right. And we like to think that it's different for all of our personal essays, but it's not. And so because I think I was trying to grab people who really weren't understanding from the beginning of a journey and pull them along, I intrinsically understood, I started to see the value of finding people in a particular spot in their understanding or education and pulling them along my journey. And knowing your audience and writing to that audience, not beyond it, is important. And especially because the internet likes to have people thinking, if I don't answer every question, if I don't hit every point, all the trolls are going to come after me. I'm going to be canceled, um, you know, and then I'll just die. You know, and people really feel like that, you know, and, yeah. and it's someone's always going to find something, you know. And so I did that. And then my other rule was basically I knew I was a black woman. I'm a black woman writing. And I was never going to have the contacts. I was not going to write the same way as someone who came through these dig different educational channels or through these internships and things like that. All I was going to have at the end of the day was my voice. And so if I couldn't look at every piece that was published under my name and recognize it clearly, I knew I was never going to build an audience. I knew that the, the desk jobs weren't waiting for me. You know, the Times wasn't going to call and say, will you be our next columnist? A, a paper wasn't going to call and say, come be our next columnist. So I was going to have to get people who like my voice, who liked what I had to say, and who followed it from place to place. And so I always tell people, don't let an editor change your voice. I mean, be nice to editors, please. Be so nice to editors. Cooperate with editors. But when you read a piece and you read it out loud, if it doesn't sound like you, you're, you're only going to become more mortified over the years as you read it. And you're going to stop an audience from being able to connect with who you are. What we have, what I have as a black woman, as a black queer woman, is valuable because I'm a black queer woman, because it is my unique perspective. Um, and if I lose sight of that and it doesn't start sound like me anymore, if you can interchange my piece with the work of anyone else, then I have nothing because whiteness gets to fill those jobs. White men get to be the desk writers who can write filler articles and do just fine sounding like everyone else. They get to sound like everyone else. There's no reason for anyone to look for me to fill that position. I have to be me. And that's, that's my value add. That's my value add to the system, to literature, to <laughs> journalism. And knowing that and staying strong to that, finding your voice and saying what works, what connects with the audience I envision for this piece in my own voice um, will help get you there. And so, you know, for my, you know, for me writing the book, it was funny because I had written so many articles, article after article. And I was lucky enough that an agent, Lauren Abramo, found me reached out to me when hardly anyone knew who I was and just said, I'm just fascinated, love following you. Have you ever thought of writing a book? And I said, no, absolutely not. Don't want to do that. Um, I have ADD. Articles are perfect for me because I can write the thing, put it down, send it off. It's done. I may never invoice. I may never answer an email, but I can do the article part. And a book sounded like way too much work on one particular thing. And she just waited. She said, okay, I'll wait. But, you know. Wow. And she did. And it was probably over a year before I came back and said, okay, you know what? Maybe I do need to write this book. And we worked on it and got the proposal out there. But find the people that believe in you. And I would say that she would not have come for it if I hadn't just been writing article after article after article after article mm. that showed that there was more in me that people might want to sit with. And that's really what I would say. Get your work out there. A lot of people go, I just need to write the book and people will come, you know what, get something out there. Keep getting your work out there. Believe in your work. Even if it's just your blog, don't denigrate that. Plenty of people build great, huge blogs that people love to follow. But just keep writing and keep putting your work out to the public and listening and getting that feedback. Mm. Were you ever stuck 
did you ever feel stuck in that process? This idea of repetition in order to find the voice and it's, you know, you are the best gift that you can give to any industry or as a creator of anything. But curiously, did you, were you blocked at any point during that process? And, uh, or was it just the necessities, the framework that you already shared with us socioeconomically that you, you needed to just keep pushing or, or, or were you stuck ever? Yeah. I mean, well, I think it was this mix of, you know, I mean, imposter syndrome is real. And I think everyone in any field, but especially creative fields and especially women and femmes, especially women and femmes of color are really socialized to believe that if we're doing well, it's luck and not our skill, not our talent. And I, the first time I ever wrote a piece that I knew was going to be published, like in a website, a real website, I had a full panic attack, full panic attack for an entire day, bawled my eyes out, had to be talked down by like three different people convinced that it wasn't the worst thing in the world, that my life was not going to be over, that I really did have the right to write about personal things. I had the right to get my voice out there. I remember like hyperventilating literally and just reaching out to everyone I knew and being like, is this the worst? Is it awful? You know, is it going to be awful? You know? Um, and, and then, you know, every piece I would say probably for the first six to eight months, I couldn't send a piece to the editor without having someone else read it first. I was so worried that I was going, that whatever it was that was working was going to stop, you know? <laughs> and I had to actually, for myself, for my own peace of mind, I had to start like, looking, spending time with all of my work and looking at similar elements and seeing, do I have a pattern? Because I was convinced that maybe I was just getting lucky, that I didn't actually have a way of writing. I didn't actually have the skill because I didn't take these classes. And I had to look and say, wait, do I have a skill? What do I have? And I start asking people, you know, when people say, I like that, I'm like, what did you like? And they're like, oh, it's great. No, I'm like, no, specifically, like what senses, what pieces, because I was trying to figure out why it worked and how, and it took me years to just believe that I'm a good writer and I still get stuck. Um, and I think that especially if you're writing, there's this idea that you'll be hit by inspiration and then you'll like finish a novel in three days. It will be amazing. And you know what, whoever does that, I hate those people. <laughs> I mean, They're awful too. people. I never want to be around them. I wish nothing but bad things for them in life. Um, because that's not how it usually works. Usually it's awful. You want to tear your hair out. You, you regret that the written word was ever invented and you, you're convinced that you've written the worst thing in the world. And, you know, even my last book, I was so convinced it was the worst book ever. People would be like, how's it going? I'm like, don't, why would you ask me that? That's so mean. Why would you ask me about my book? Um, and what I realized, and I have to remind myself of constantly is that just because something is hard, it doesn't mean it's bad. And when it comes to creative fields, I think we're thought, you know, we're supposed to think, oh, it was a breeze. I was, you know, I, w I was inspired. My muse arrived and I wrote it and it was beautiful. And instead it was like, oh, I hated it. I had to drag myself to my computer every day. And I was convinced it was the worst thing in the world because it wasn't fun. And it's not fun. It's a job. And that can really mess you up because you can think like some of my best pieces, I hated writing. I had one piece that I wrote and it, I, I, it's such a solid piece. And I didn't send it out for publication for probably eight months because I hated writing it so much that I was convinced it was awful. And I had to like put it in the bad bin and then come back to it and then be like, oh, oh, this isn't this isn't the garbage I thought it was. It was just a tough piece. And even with, with my book, you know, you go through so much both books and I'm like, oh, this is awful. And then you get through your all your, rev you know, your revisions. And I'm like, did I write this? Oh, that's a good sense. When did I when did I in between all the trash I was apparently writing? I wrote this good paragraph. Oh, and this one, too. Um, and I think we have to be more realistic about what creative life is like, because yeah, I know it's what I'm supposed to be doing. And that pulls me through, you know, the times where I would rather be doing absolutely anything else, which is most of the time. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, just not that you need it, but just so you know, the world, Christine McDonough, your writing is so exemplary. I tell my friends to read everything you write. Jenna from Jenna's Homecoming, I spend time with all of your work. 
Brooke Eston from Spain, thank you so much for doing this. Luis, what I love so much about Ijoma is not just the great mindset and perspective, it's the deep purpose, the anti-racism, and you're just so awesome. So oh. I, it's it's scrolling too fast. I had to take a screen cap <laughs> in order to get the praise. So um, maybe somewhere in here is a lesson for those listening and watching right now. Um, thank you for being so candid about your process. And, you know, here you are, uh, as you said, you started writing, writing, um, your book in, uh, 2016, is that what you said mm -hmm. 20, for when you want so, so you want to talk about race and here we are, you know, four years later and the, um, the outpouring of support, uh, is a really curious, um, comment from Ravi. I'm in Melbourne, Australia, born in Fiji of Indian heritage. I completely disconnected from my culture in order to fit into Western culture. In 2014, I found out my grand, I found my grandmother who I thought had passed away and she helped connect me to my heritage. The question is, she's, she, you know, Ravi, sorry, Ravi says, you know, I'm working to dismantle structural racism. So my three-year-old son doesn't face the pain I did growing up. The question is, is your work for future generations or now? I think I know the answer because it was a little bit of, you know, we foreshadowed it in the beginning of the conversation, <laughs> but I was curious if you could um, respond specifically to Ravi. Yeah, um, I think it's for all. I mean, I, I feel like where I am in this process right now is definitely trying to hold space and protect the work that young people are doing and they're doing some of the most important work right now i i believe that our vision changes our vision is limited by the time that we're in right so my idea of freedom is much more limited than an 18 year old activist idea of freedom because of where i grew up in what had been accomplished as i was coming up versus what's been accomplished now but i'm also you know working to honor the people who have built the space for me to stand today. And, and also I believe in every, you know, I'm, I'm in the battle for black lives. I believe in every black life. So yeah, mine, mine as well. Mine and my children, um, my grandchildren, my community. Um, but also, you know, my, my father who's been dead for, you know, 12 years. Um, I think that we all deserve joy and to thrive and we deserve freedom and in the struggle that I know we won't see victory in my lifetime. We're not going to see the end of white supremacy in my lifetime. But in the battle for black lives, in the battle for all of our lives free from racial oppression, we can still see and protect joy. And we can still, you know, take our moments of success. And we can take each life saved and celebrate that. So... I don't believe that you reach a time where your time has passed. I definitely become less relevant in the struggle as time goes on. And that makes me so happy. Um, but I still know I have use to hold and to keep things moving forward in my privilege, in my access, in my experience um, for myself and for everyone. You know, I've, I've run into people who are just discovering at 60 that they don't have to live half a life, you know, that they can be whole people, that they can still say what happened to me matters and I deserve better. And it's never too late. And that's a beautiful thing to see. So, you know, I think we have to just fight for all of us all the mm -hmm. time. You mentioned earlier, um, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, um, this idea that I'm about to share came up in an earlier conversation I had with Roxane Gay, whom I know um, you are um, connected to. And it's this idea of it's hard to be what you can't see out in the world. And you've done such a good job of showing up as to, to being seen with the recognition of your book and all of the work that no one ever sees. I'm wondering if there are some things that people still can't see that we need, we need more of, we need more people in a particular area. Could you be prescriptive at all? What areas that we can't see 
um, ought we ought we cultivate people showing up in that space? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that what needs to happen first and foremost is we need first an accurate accounting of where we've been, right? Um, people of color, trans people, disabled people, we have queer people. We've been everywhere, and we have done everything. Maybe not to the same degree, but we have. And and because we've done it in the face of such obstacles makes it even, you know, more important. Um, and that needs to be accurately told. You know, the amount of times that I run into young people who just have no idea that anyone has come before, that needs to, that needs to be shown. But also I think, you know, what we need to do is recognize that there, that we exist as more than struggle and that you know, we have something to offer every field, every experience, but also that our basic humanity matters. What I would love to see, I would love to see just mediocre ass people of every demographic doing fine. Like I would love that, right? I wouldn't, I would love to get away from the whole, you have to be exceptional. Like we have to have, you know what? I, I of course want to see black excellence in every field. I also want to see regular ass, medium talented people who just want to go to work and be a member of their community do fine. I, I don't want exceptional to have to be what gets us by, you know, like we are human beings and I want more examples of that. I want, I, I, I don't want it to be, we are either, you know, criminalized and turned into like the bad guys or we are, um, exceptional and we're presidents and we're, you know, astrophysicists. Uh, we can also just, you know, live our life and there needs to be space for that. And I would also say, you know, I spend a lot of time in corporate settings. I spend a lot of time talking to other people. Is there a lens, layer, lens flare here that I can? There is, it was, it's like, it looks like little diamonds are being sprinkled Aww, on the... <laughs> that's so sweet. There, okay. Um, a little better, thank you. It's a little better. So, you know, I'm constantly telling people because you hear these phrases that annoy the crap out of me where people are like, I don't want to be the first black engineer at this company. I want to be a great engineer who happens to be black. Like I actually want people to recognize the value of our unique lived experiences of our unique cultural perspectives, um, of our unique accomplishments in every field. I want that to be part of what people seek out. I want people to actually seek out those experiences and seek out and say, no, you know what? We actually do need more Asian English teachers in this school. We actually do need, you know, more black weathermen on TV. We need that because it adds to the field. It is of value. It is not just, and it's not just of value so that people can see themselves in these positions. It's of value because of what the unique experience and cultural, you know, um, cultural experience and ideals adds. You know, we all, we are different culturally in many ways um, and very diverse within our races and ethnicities. And we bring that along with all of our other skills to the spaces we're in. And I would love to see that valued. I would love to see that be sought after the way we seek after so many other skill sets um, and appreciated for what it is. Mm. Your journey has not been without uh, peril and risk and pain, and you've written and talked about that in, in a number of different places. And one of the things that I love uh, about your work is your focus on self-care. And I'm wondering for people, anyone putting themselves out there, I think you know you could probably. Um, I'm trying to make this universal, so it's not just your particular lens on self-care, but maybe the, be the best way of asking it then is like, what role does self-care play in your ability to show up and your ability to do hard things in your ability to put the art that you want to represent in the world out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say when I talk about, when I talk about self-care or when people ask me about self-care, I think it's really important that we decolonize the idea of self-care and that we like de-white the idea of self-care, um, because 
self-care is culturally relative. Um, and for me, sometimes self-care is what I do just for myself. Sometimes it's community care. And I think that especially, you know, I think the black community and many other communities of color are, we get by with each other. Right. And it's not, can I have a spa day? It's who calls me? Who do I call? Who, who do I bring dinner to? You know, who do I reach out to, um, to rejuvenate? And it's really, for me, about finding, you know, what is your purpose and finding a purpose in love. We have to, there is this idea, especially um, in the Black community, that we have to be martyrs for, for our cause, that we have to sacrifice everything to get by, we have to sacrifice everything to fight racism, instead of recognizing that we are fighting for our lives, we are fighting to thrive, we are fighting because we deserve to be happy, fulfilled, secure, safe people with secure families and communities. And if you don't replenish that, you know, if you don't realize that your life is the black life you're fighting for, or your life, you know, regardless of what you're fighting for, that you are what you're fighting for as well. You're not just fighting externally. Um, if you don't find what rejuvenates you, what motivates you, that lives in a space of love, you won't be able to continue on in your work. And, and I would say that, especially for people in marginalized populations, it's not just what can you do to get out and protest? It's what can you do to get through a day at the office, you know, in a world that is not built for you, in a world that can be very hostile to you. You're not just fighting for that next paycheck. You know, you, you have to do things that remind you that you deserve joy, that your community deserves joy. And that means that you have to really give it that time. And so for me, it's trying to remember that I have to be very deliberate, trying to remember that I have to say, even now, you know, we are on the Oregon coast and I had to remind myself today, like I can just not do things today. Like I came here to relax because I needed to relax came here to spend time with my family and I'm going to intentionally do that because that's what I'm fighting for and working for. And if I went through all of this and I didn't see, you know, see my family, didn't take care of myself, that I'm no longer fighting for that, you know? And, and that's, it's important to remember that and to keep that focus more than focus on what we're trying to avoid, focus on, you know, the pain we're trying to, to get through, to also recognize we're trying to nurture joy. Mm. Wow. Thank you for that. Again, I just got to let you know the Morgan and Jenna, Maria, Stephanie, Jonas, <laughs> Jeremiah, Jenna, Corey, just expressing a huge amount of gratitude for your truth and what you're saying today. I wanted to thank you. Um, I'm curious if we can shift gears to all of the things you're working on. You mentioned early on how or I guess collectively we, we talked about how the book is now, you know, three plus years on two to three years on. And it's obviously in the context of now having just a huge, as you said, you've sold more books in the last month than you have in the last two and a half years. But I'm, I have just some, I don't know, is it your, you've got more stuff coming and I'm wondering if you can tell us some of the things that are exciting to you right now about your work as a creator, if you can share um, both you know, different media that you're working in um, and why you're making some of these choices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my next book coming out in December is called Mediocre, Dangerous Legacy of White Male America. Um, a pretty self-explanatory book, I think, uh, title-wise, just like the last one was. But this is looking at 150 years of the formation of violent white male identity in this country and the way in which it protects itself at great cost to everyone of all races, ethnicities, and genders. Um, and that is a book that I poured a lot of work into. It is very different from the current book. Um, it was very difficult to write, especially writing through a lot of what our family went through this last year, writing through, you know, a pandemic. I'm proud of it and look forward to it finally being out into the world. I am very excited about a film that I am in with 
that my brother, Ahame Filealuo, and Charles Mudede, the brilliant Charles Mudede, wrote. And if you aren't familiar with Charles, but you have read my interview I did with Rachel Dolezal a couple years ago, Charles was the editor of that piece and also the person who kind of, I wouldn't have written it if it weren't for him. If anyone else had asked me, I would have said absolutely not. I almost said absolutely not to Charles himself. I think I answered the phone knowing he was going to ask me and said no. And then he talked me into it because he knows my voice better than myself sometimes. Um, but I used to work with Charles constantly and he and my brother are very close, wrote this amazing film, um, called Thin Skin. And I play a fictionalized version of myself. I had to learn how to be an actor type person. Um, and it was a brilliant project. So much fun. It was so beautiful working with my brother, working with Charles. I actually just saw like an almost completely finished version of it the other day wow. and I was like what it actually looks like a movie because <laughs> you're making it I was like oh these reviews you know are going to be like well you know someone's kid made a movie and well, what it was he drove doing it you know but no it looks like a real movie um I'm so excited about that so those are two main things and then I'm just you know for me hopefully for for now I'm I'm looking at like writing creatively you know so I'm trying to you know I've been very clear of like, I, I think this for the next couple of years, hopefully is my last book that's specifically like a hard nonfiction on racism in America. I just, I need to connect with writing for joy. Believe it or not, it's not incredibly fun to like spend two years looking up genocide and torture and imprisonment and death Um and I would love my writing to benefit me as much or maybe even more, you know, because chances are my beginning fiction is going to be God awful. So probably more than it benefits other people. But I would love to like try fiction. I would love to take writing workshops and stuff like that. So that's been my goal once the next book's out in the world and we do all of that to settle in and just be a, a writing student again um, and live in that space. So that's kind of been, yeah, what we've been I've been up to. Wow. Well, I should take a second and, and uh, give a nod to Charles, who was the first person that shared your work with me some time ago. And he was on this show 10 years ago. Wow. 10 years ago last month, he was on this exact same show. So you can, if, if uh, anyone wants to go take a look, it's just my name and Charles Mudede, <laughs> M-U-D-E-D-E. -E. Um, but yeah, what a wonderful human. And um is idea of filmmaking like how about is the acting more exciting for you the writing what what roles and then also why is it just the newness is it because it's something different is it another vehicle uh for your work that may seem may hit a different audience or all three what's what are why it was it was a real mix so for the, for the film it was it was a mix of things one it was working with my brother, who I, my brother and I are incredibly close. We're a year and a half apart in age, but we don't work together very often creatively. You know, he's a musician and a musician and storyteller in different space. But also, I love working with Charles. And the thought of working with Charles, you know, I am stubborn to, I am, I stick to my morals to a fault. So people who follow my work closely know that I have been very mad at the stranger and that actually ended my working relationship with Charles who's there. And I've desperately missed it. You know, I mean, like I literally cried missing working with him. The, probably one of the best working relationships I ever had as a writer was with Charles. And so in this whole new capacity um, to work with him. Now, Charles snuck this up on me. If, if, if you know Charles and you know Charles, he's a character, yes. right? So he this started with him calling me Ijoma. Um, can you do me a big favor, dear? What? Oh, well, you know, the person that was going to read your line, the lines to play you, they, they can't make it. Can you read the lines? Okay. So I show up at this pass-through, read the lines. And he's like, oh, you're good at this. Would you play you? And at this point, it was literally like five lines. I was like, sure. Yeah, okay, fine, whatever. I can probably do five lines playing myself. My little Courtney Love moment, right? And uh, I was like, okay, all right. Then we got together for his birthday, maybe a year later, six months to a year later. And he was like, oh, you know, the people, the money people for the movie, they keep telling me I have to have a talk to you about the film before we move forward. I'm like, okay. And he was like, it's just the parts changed a little bit. A little bit. 
I'm like, oh, okay. He's like, we'll talk about it later. We don't talk about it later. Then a few weeks, a few months later, I get a script. It's literally the second most lines in the character in the movie after my brother. It, it went from being five lines to like a major one. And I was like, oh, are these the, the few changes Charles, <laughs> that you were this talking about? So classic Here. Charles, too. Yeah. Just the breadcrumb. Oh, my God. Yeah. Amazing. It's like, oh, you'll be perfect. He kept saying, you'll be the next Oprah Winfrey. That's what he kept saying. It was amazing. So I was like, ah, oh, crap. Sorry to take acting lessons. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. Um, but it was so fun. I loved it so much. I learned, you know, that it's a very different life. Like, writers are like, oh, I'll write now when I wake up. And acting, it's like, oh, I have to be somewhere. And I have to be there all day. And you don't care, like, that I'm tired or that I have a thing with my kids. Like, nope, you got to be there on set. And Charles was a delight. Like, he was so my quintessential Charles moment is we're trying to shoot the scene and there is a um, lizard in a cage, not part of the scene, but just in the scene. But he wanted the lizard to move desperately and the lizard would not move. And I'm in the room next to him. My brother is pretending to talk to me through a door. And so I hear him going, oh, let's try it again. Let's get this lizard to move. Eight takes later, this lizard <laughs> has not moved. And I finally, my brother goes, wait a minute, Charles, is this about the fucking lizard? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to sub a, we're going to have a stand in lizard here any second yeah, now. <laughs> exactly. He just wanted the lizard. And like we, we did one scene where we had the, working with a child, which can be difficult, right? A young child, child, we get this scene and, and you know, after a couple of takes, Charles comes out and goes, the snake was amazing. <laughs> just like, so yeah, I loved it. I loved every moment of it. I don't know if I would ever, I don't know if I would want to act again, but I loved like being a part of that whole creative process of taking something, you know, this piece, my brother's worked on this piece in various stages for 10 years and to see it translate to film, to know you could translate our life to mm. film. Like I was like, what? Our weird, boring life? Okay. Um, yeah, I loved it. It was really fun. Uh, and just for reference for anyone who, uh, saw the show. It's it's based, if I'm not mistaken, on Now I'm Fine. Yes. The uh, the was it a one man performance that your brother? Sort of, is yeah. That right? they call it? Um, the New York Times called him a jazz memoirist, and so it's a spoken word slash Music, like yeah. seventeen or piece orchestra, you know, singing, storytelling, jokes type thing, and then they took that and translated it into like a film. Yeah. I am. When when can we expect this? When is this um, happening? Yeah, so, I mean, we are, it is pretty much done. And we're looking at, like, late summer, getting it into festivals and getting it out there. Of course, the pandemic put a wrench into everything. But, yeah, we are looking at actually getting it out to the world soon. So definitely follow us on, like, Instagram. There is a Thin Skin Film Instagram page. Or, you know, follow me or follow Aham or follow, follow Charles. Um, and we post, you know, whatever information we have when we have it. Uh, that was my sort of wrap up is if there can be some attention that you are able to direct for the people who are watching this, because they will, there will be um, a lot of people watch this and they will, it, it, it will have a lifespan. And I'm wondering, is there something in particular that you would direct them to body of work, course of action? Um, what are some tactics and to, to either further connect people to your work or what would you what would you like to ask of anyone who's participating and watching right now? You know, I would absolutely say that it is really important to look at who you're listening to, who you're getting information from and diversify as much as possible. Um, and, and don't diversify within whiteness. So a lot of times what I find oftentimes, especially like, but even, even within our own ethnic groups, racial groups or social groups will say, who are you following that you like? And we're asking people just like us, like, who are you listening to other version of me? And then they give slightly different flavors of the same person. Um, start branching out, right? Look for it to be like, this is someone who is way more radical than me or slightly more conservative than me. Who are they looking at? Who are they listening to? But then look at things like, am I, do I have enough indigenous voices giving me news? Like, where am I getting my daily news? Am I getting it from CNN or am I getting it from environmental activists, from indigenous activists, from disabled activists, right? From black activists. If I'm following black activists, are they all light-skinned, privileged, 
black writers and thinkers or do we have people who are incarcerated right i many people don't know that like people who are incarcerated right now are putting out written work that you can read and find out about what's happening and you know are am i learning about from you know black trans disabled people right like am i really getting all of this information because it all matters and the, that perspective matters and what we're doing a lot of times is playing catch up for what the most marginalized people have been saying for a long time you will learn so much more your idea of the world will be so much broader you will get so much more from anything you see on the news you will understand on a deeper level if you start broadening who you follow so really branch out there uh you know start looking up words like abolition like put abolition in your searches if you're looking up environmental rights put abolition in that search if you're looking up you know race theory put abolition in the, like put the most radical terms you can think of out there find what the you know writers and thinkers are and then look at their sources if you find an article you love look at the sources click on the links find out who they're referencing follow those people but diversify where your knowledge comes from every day an exercise i used to have people do in workshops is i would say start pick a day out of the week and look at every interaction you have and what it touches and think of how much of that is white and male or abled, right? And so you get up and you're making coffee. Where's this coffee coming from? Who's making money from that coffee? When you're watching the news, who's presenting that news? Who's writing the scripts? Who's advertising it? When you're getting dressed, who's making money off the clothes that you're wearing? You know, like what's, who's making, you know, cult, who's getting culturally relevant from that? You know, when you're listening to music, who's making money from that industry? Like who, you know, who's picking what you're listening to? All of these things day in and day out and look at that and just see where you can diversify that. See where you can branch out because different people exist in all of these spaces and you can really branch that out. So just try that exercise for a day. Even quoting people, get in an argument, when you're getting in an argument on Facebook, look and see how often you're quoting white dudes in your argument, you know, and, and think of how absurd it would be like, according to this white dude, we should do this. And according to this white dude, we should do this. And then according to this white dude and, and write it out like a script. I went to this dinner owned by white people, you know, and made money from this version of an ethnic food that was made by white people. And then I went home and I watched the evening news and listened to a white man tell me about news from a white male perspective. And, you know, and then I, you know, went, you know, and just, Think of your day and then realize how absurd that is and see what you can do to diversify it. Mm. I would love to share just a, a short story along those lines that th this has been a, um, a powerful experience when, um, for me, I wrote a book and I cataloged every single example on every single page, the um, race, gender, um, point of view of the example. And prior to starting that, that research project, I asked everyone who'd read it what they thought about all of the, the balance in the book. And it was, oh yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was good. I mean, it was like, yeah, yeah. And the research yielded just shocking results. And so as someone who is, um, started this work and, um, will never be completed. Um, I just want to say that that has added so much richness to my life. I learned from your Instagram uh, a couple weeks ago about colorism as an example. And I have to say it's, it's created a richness and I just feel it, it simultaneously has me feeling terrible and inspired at the same time. And um, so I want to thank you and, and, um, I can't wait to have you back on the show when you get your next, when your next book's out there and the film, I'm, I'm already like Googling it as we've been talking here, trying to find anything <laughs> I can out. And I know it'll be out there in good time. I just mm -hmm. thank you for sharing your wisdom, your vision, your journey, um, around, um, pursuing your dreams and, and career. And thank you for your work. Thank you so much. This was a real pleasure. I'm uh, I'm going to keep you on the line for another 90 seconds, but uh, mm -hmm. the world is out there cheering, as I've shared so many times. Um, thank you for participating and uh, the world. You know where to go to um, to find Ijoma's work. Uh, she is I-J-E-O-M-A-O-L-U-O dot com. 
and Instagram. I, I'm a consumer of her Instagram as well. Uh, anything else, anywhere else in the world you'd like to, to point us besides at the book, of course, but anything in particular before we go? Um, if you, if, if anyone wants to follow what I'm up to, follow, everything's under my name. I figure you can learn my name. You can learn anything. But also just look at youth activists right now. Youth are doing amazing things. Find out what young people are doing. I, I, I exclusively look right now towards people between the ages of 17 and 25, and they inspire me greatly. Um, and here in Seattle, um, Mutual Aid Books is doing some great work. Young people getting great books out at protests and community events for people to learn more. But all over the world, we're seeing young people do amazing things. Spend time looking at them. Take them seriously because our media isn't. Mm. Thank you so much. And for everyone else out there in the world, you know where to go to support uh, Ijoma and her work. And uh, looking forward to having you back on the show another time soon. And I bid you all adieu. Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You can be, and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So, essentially, we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with 5, 10, or 15 hours of great content, but now if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or want to be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass, and then all this is yours. If you're feeling isolated and looking for creative connection, by tuning into creativelive.com slash TV. That's where we've got a 24 seven live stream from the kitchen counters. I can do that back lit shot that I really like to do. From the studios and living rooms of many of the world's top creators where we're doing musical performances, Q and A's, cooking shows, virtual book tour events, drawing, spoken word poetry, and more. Life passed me by waiting for an invitation when the world is greater than my nation or my occupation. Be someone you've never been. You feel all that adrenaline, it's medicine. It actually helps me feel like my days are more purposeful. I hope that out of this deep pain will come some collective growth. Dive into Creative Live TV today.